Uh, yeah, I'm actually trying to get everything uh, in this for five minutes, so it will be a challenge. challenge. And that, that for theories part is that I will make this on the blackboard. I will use new slides. So I cheated a bit and started on these diagrams. Save some time. Um, <laughs> and the other for theories mm. part is that I, I will try to do this in a way so that we can sort of. Uh, have some common view of what we actually know from the observation side, and specifically how this relates to any extended theory of gravity. Uh, and if you want to talk about observations, you can do this with a lot of assumptions, or you can do it with a very few assumptions. So, the classical way to do it with a lot of assumptions is to say that we observe a lambda CDM universe here. Okay? That it's very true, it's very descriptive, but it involves uh, many assumptions. And uh, th that's the most common way to do it. And I think that you, <coughs> what you will do probably on the end, right? Uh, yeah. No, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and then you can do you know, less, less and less assumptions. Of course, you can go to the extreme point saying that, okay, we're sitting in the outskirts of a spiral galaxy, we have a few telescopes uh, catching a number of photons with different energies, and that is sort of what we know. This is more like the skeptic point of view, uh, which can be refreshing. It can also be extremely irritating for the skeptics. So I would try to do something in between those. Uh, sometimes I will try to state the assumptions that I do. Sometimes I, I will not. Sometimes I might not even be aware of the specific assumptions that I do when I when I say something. But <coughs> so I would review the current observational. Uh, uh, status that we have in cosmology today. And of course we hope to improve on that in the future. I mean, much of what I will say today is that we know stuff with like approximately five percent position. This holds for many of the things that we know and it could very well be that in the near future all that happens is that we know the same stuff but perhaps with half the error size. Of course we hope that, that you know, the case. I mean, there are definitely big things that could happen because we could detect the dark matter particle. There is such. Uh, we could uh, see that we need uh, tensor perturbations uh, in addition to scalar perturbations. We could see that uh, what is accelerating the expansion of the universe might not be described by a constant equation of state. I mean, those things are things that could happen, right? So we hope for that. And I think Ariel will talk more. More about especially the last thing I mentioned here. Uh, so uh, the first assumption that I will make is that when we talk about cosmology, that we can separate the background from what happens on top of that background. And uh, that is probably a very reasonable assumption, at least if you just consider small perturbations on top of the background, what we normally regard as linear perturbations. Then I think everyone agrees that this is a very reasonable. But we know that everything that we sort of observe in the universe is non-linear. It does not represent small perturbations. It really represents huge deviations from, from the background. So in this case, we are actually not sure that we can do this separation. But I will assume that we can do that. There are people working on theories where you try not to make this assumption. It's very hard. And so basically, we don't know nothing about what kind of results we expect these cases. This is what is uh, commonly referred to as back reaction. So let's see, the, the background then. So in, in ordinary general relativity then we, um, we make an assumption that we can do this um, separation and then we also normally make an assumption that the background is, is uh, homogeneous and isotropic and we can put this ansatz into our gravitational theory, uh, general relativity. And we get solutions. And these solutions tell us that we have some dynamic to the, to the background. Basically, it can grow, or it can shrink, or anything. And that's the thing. You can get anything, right? Because the, the, the solutions that you get, they're completely governed by the energy density that you put into your equations. And as long as we don't have any strong priors on these energy densities, you can get anything. So. If we look observationally on how the background behaves, 
And then we try to compare that with uh, what our equations for general relativity tells us. Then we, uh, we can say that these make sense or they do not make sense, depending on whether you think the energy content uh, that this implies makes sense or not makes sense. So that this energy content is, of course, the <coughs> lambda CDM universe. That in addition to the matter that we know very well, we also have dark matter and uh, cosmology. So, <clears throat> so this is what we do in general relativity. But then we want to, of course, then compare this with observations. So now I will try to draw up what we actually have observed regarding the background evolution of the universe. So uh, this is time on the x-axis, uh, and this is today. <coughs> And this is size, so that is relative size. Of course, we don't know if the universe has infinite or finite extent. So I will just say that this could, for instance, be the size of our observable, of, of the observable universe today. Uh, as uh, uh, so, so let's see, this is units of the size of the observable universe today. So that means that today we have a value of one. Okay. <clears throat> so I would argue that the most important observation we have in cosmology is this here. It's basically that uh, we have a slope here. That the size of the universe is changing and it is expanding. So this we have known for quite a long time. Uh, <clears throat> so this is sort of what we have to relate to. Any theory uh, has to have this expansion rate today. So it's, it's going like this. Uh, <coughs> if we Let's say that we would have a completely empty universe. Then we would have something equivalent to Newton's first law. That basically, if, if you don't have anything uh, affecting the motion of body, you just uh, continue that the same way forever. So that's also true for um, the universe. If it's completely empty, you don't have any gravity, you would just have something that continues the same way. Uh, so, uh, if this would be the case, then the universe would have an age of uh, approximately 14 billion years. So that means that it expands, it expands very slowly, right? It takes like, something like 14 billion years for the volume to, 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 to double. This also means that if you take, uh, let's, let's take a chunk of space that is, has the same size. So let's take a box that you can exactly fit the Earth into that box. This means that this box will grow with one millimeter per year. So that's the expansion of space of the universe. So it, it expands very slowly. But then, of course, you put some matter into it, and then you would say that, yeah, probably this expansion rate will change, right? It will probably slow down with time, so then you would get something like this. You still have to have this expansion rate that we measure today, but then you could think of something like this. And perhaps something even uh, contracting in, in the far future. <coughs> Or you could say that, yeah, perhaps for some reason the, 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 the expansion would accelerate, it would expand faster and faster with time. So then you have to put something like this. So the first thing you notice is that you get different ages of these universes, right? For an uh, accelerating universe, you would get something with a higher age. If you have a, uh, a decelerating <coughs> universe, you would get a lower age. So that is one observation constraint that you can put in, but that's sort of model dependent, so I don't to talk too much about that. But then, of course, you can also imagine that you have some combination of this. <coughs> so, for instance, just a random example would be if you have something accelerating now and decelerating in the past. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so this is... Uh, actually what we observe. So how do we then observe this? How, how can we actually observe this? Well, <coughs> what you do then is uh, to get this, you want to observe the size as a function of time. And the size you can get by just measuring redshifts. I mean, the redshift is, is uh, directly connected to the size of the universe when the photons were emitted. And the time is also quite easy because it just is given the distance. I mean, if something is at least now 5 billion five, uh, light years, you know that that photon was emitted 5 billion years ago, right? 
so the way you do this, I mean, the, the classic approach is to use supernovae for that, and Ariel will talk more about this, so I will not say too much about this. But uh, so what you can do then is that you can measure the distances and the redshift of the supernovae, and then you get the forms of these curves. And this you can do basically up to redshift such that the universe was half the size as it is now. So we basically have supernova measurements in these, this interval. Okay. <coughs> and I actually managed to draw this pretty good because you can see that with supernovae, we have a lot of measurements where you can see this current accelerating phase, and we have some indications at least that you can see this decelerating phase of the expansion. So this is what we have with the supernovae. We have a lot of measurements here, we have fewer and fewer and fewer, and then we have just a few measurement points here. In total, we have something like close to a thousand supernovae, each of them giving you a distance measurement of approximately 20%. So of course, uh, if this would be all we had, it would not be very good because we wouldn't know anything about what's happening here. Uh, so we actually have one point about this. And uh, we have one point here. Okay. <coughs> this point corresponds to a value of when the <coughs> size was approximately the 1,000 of the size it is today. And this is of course, the <coughs> cosmological microwave background, the same. So in terms of the background expansion, we basically have one thing with the CMB, and this is the typical scale of the acoustic oscillations in, in the <coughs> cosmic microwave background. So you know that when the universe was at, at even uh, smaller sizes than this, everything was so compressed that the photons interacted too frequently with, with the barriers so that they couldn't really travel freely, right? But at this point, the universe uh, was becoming uh, uh, so uh, loosely populated and has so uh, low temperature that the electrons and the protons could combine to neutral atoms and this interacted much less frequently with the photons. So basically, from this point onwards, the photons could propagate freely. So we basically get the snapshot of what the universe looked like. That. This uh, very high redshift is very uh, small scale. Um, of course, the picture you should have is that before this, you might be tempted to have like visualize this so of like particles interacting all the time. It's not what's happening. I mean, let's pick uh, a point slightly before this uh, point where the photons travel freely. I mean, a photon would normally interact something like once every 100,000 years. So it, it's not it's not a very dense soup. It's actually a very empty universe also then. Uh, <coughs> but this is very good because we can uh, calculate the scale, the physical scale of these fluctuations. And we can measure the angular scale that they depend on the sky today. And especially this measurement, we can measure the angular scale with something like 0.1% accuracy. This gives you a, an extremely uh, well-measured point on this curve. The only problem is that the physical scale we cannot, uh, that, that we have to calculate. So we don't know that to as high precision. But we still have a point here with something like a percent accuracy. And even more is that these uh, fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, uh, they will persist today because these are small fluctuations on a given length scale. And you can actually see this also in how baryons are distributed today in the universe. So if you look at galaxies and you look at the positions of galaxies, and you can see how these positions are correlated. You can see that that's this specific length scale that you put with the CMB, you also can see this in the, in the correlation function of the galaxies. And this is what then is called barrier acoustic oscillations. But of course, I mean, it's barrier acoustic oscillations also in, in the early universe, right? So this should have to be called galaxy acoustic oscillations. But anyway, we can measure this scale so it's, it's very good because this is the same physical scale that we have in the CMB. So that means that even though we 
I mean, we only have to calculate this once, or you can even take like the ratio of these measurements and get rid of this physical scale altogether. But uh, you can measure these parent-acoustic oscillations in the galaxy distributions, and basically you do this over more or less the same range that you can measure for the supernovae. So nowadays you have something like 10 data points here, each giving this distance to something like Five percent accuracy. Okay, and this is it. This is sort of what we can directly observe about the background expansion. So we can uh, note, for instance, that in this interval here, we don't know anything. <coughs> so we have no observations whatsoever in, in this interval regarding the the. the evolution of the background expansion and actually, actually very few observations of anything whatsoever. <clears throat> what we can ask ourselves is do we have anything before this? Well then things start to get a bit less direct because we can't really observe anything uh, at higher redshift than the cosmic microwave background and we will not be able to do so unless we can observe neutrinos or, or gravitational waves. Uh, but we can have some more indirect evidence. And one thing that we do have is that you can sort of infer that we should have some knowledge about what happens at the point here when the scale factor was a billion of what it is today. And this is given by nuclear synthesis. Big bang synthesis. So what does that tell us? Tell us. Well, <clears throat> the thing is that when you uh, start to synthesize the, the elements that we observe today, it turns out that this is sensitive to the fact that the neutron is not a stable particle. So we know that it has a half-life. The free neutron has a half-life of something like 50 minutes. And you can actually see this in the distribution of, of, of the heavy elements that, that you uh, at, at this uh, point here. And you can show that uh, at the temperatures that you, where you have this uh, process going on, you want the expansion rate to correspond to approximately the same time scale as the, as the <coughs> half time uh, of, of a neutron. So this actually tells us something about the slope of this curve at this very point here. So it's not a very precise limit, but at least it tells us something that, that you can't have anything going on here. I mean, you have to sort of obey this limit that you have on, on the slope of this curve here, which is it's not a very hard limit, but still. And then, of course, you can go even further back, and you can discuss inflation. Uh, and this is then even more indirect, and I would argue that uh, the question about inflation is, is really a question about initial conditions. So in terms of, of this background expansion, there are some things here that are not exactly clear, right? Uh, I did not mention it, but we know that observationally that, that the, the spatial geometry of the universe is very close to flat. And I said that, we, well, this was an assumption in, in uh, that, that you often make, but you can actually observe that the universe looks very homogeneous, it looks very isotopic, and just to be able to explain this, we have to really fine-tune our initial conditions. And one way to do this is to have, even further back here, you have a, some very short period where you have this accelerated expansion, which you call inflation. And this turns out to be important, not only for the background expansion, but also when you talk about fluctuations. So I, I will come back to this. Uh, but related to this, we should also uh, remember that if inflation would be true, we know that we have had a period of accelerated expansion going into some period of decelerated expansion. So we actually don't know what will happen here in the future. I mean, it might very well be that we have something like this. And perhaps it is. That, of course, we don't know anything about. <coughs> Okay, so this, I think, is sort of what we know about the background expansion. Uh, any questions about that or any comments?
Yes? A measurement that the universe is spatially flat based on the first acoustic being, is that dependent on GI? Um, I'm not sure actually. Good question. I'm not sure. In what sense? I mean, it clearly doesn't depend on the field. Sorry? It clearly doesn't depend on the field. Well, but it. I mean, time depends on the field. Yeah, but it depends on the field. Because you need to assume something of the Hubble constant as a function of the red, red, red shift. So. Yeah, I, I my, my gut feeling is that it is uh, does depend on that. Uh, because it's basically given by the position of the first peak and uh, yeah, the analysis of that it is being quite dependent on the geom. Okay. But clearly you can have a crazy source which is like a curvature coming from somewhere else. If you want to, you see, I think you will you need to assume something about the equation, the, the equation right? otherwise. You can say this is not curvature over scale factor to a, to a power, but a new source of matter. You see what I mean? And they cancel exactly. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. In I mean, principle, you need to really. But, but I guess, is it possible to have some crazy different background expansion? And ah, the universe I was looking at the level. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, guess not. I think that actually, I mean, the limits that we usually quote on the curvature, I, I'm pretty sure that that is very modern dependent because it's actually, I mean, normally you explain this as being due to the curvature of space, and this is not correct. Uh, <coughs> because I, I don't know if you have seen this, but sometimes you draw this. This should be the CMB surf surface, and this should be the size of the typical fluctuations. And then you say that, uh, okay, let's say that we have flat geometry. And these fluctuations should subtend some specific angle. If you have a closed geometry, this will subtend a larger angle. If you have a small, uh, if you have an open universe, this will subtend a much smaller angle. Uh, this is not what's happening, right? This is not what it's mostly sensitive to. I mean, you can, you can just see this by calculating what kind of angles you get for different uh, universes. Mm -hmm. So basically, what you can say is that curvature will give two different kind of contributions. One is this factor of sine in front of the integral when you cut the distances. And the other part is that you actually have something in the integral that depends on your curvature, right? And this is actually sensitive to both of these. So that's it. I'm pretty sure that 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 the, the, the limits that we put today they, they should be more dependent. I don't know if it's possible to keep it. Yes. Uh, in terms of the perturbations, or what would mean? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that now, actually. Yeah. Okay, so this was the background. And now we'll turn to the fluctuations on top of this. So this is like very simple. Uh, and now we'll come to the more complicated stuff, namely all the interesting stuff, stuff that happens on top of this macro. And then I said that this is, this is very good way to divide things, at least if you look at small fluctuations in front of the background, because as long as you do linear perturbation theory, you can really see that it is decoupled. Uh, and also, I mean, it's very nice to do linear perturbation uh, theory, because uh, only that, not only do you get this natural uh, decoupling from the background, you also see that regardless of what kind of fluctuations you put in, I mean, you can put in simple scalar perturbations, where you could put in vector perturbations, or tensor perturbations. In the linear regime, they, they will all evolve independently of each other. And not only that, the uh, fluctuations on different length scales, they will also evolve independently. So it's really easy to calculate stuff in the linear regime. And when you go non-linear, which is basically when the density fluctuations uh, get to be like order of one, uh, then things become much more.
I first of all you get this, uh, I mean the scalar and the vector and the tensor modes, they will interact with each other. I mean different length scales will not evolve independently. And also you see that you have to take into account <coughs> only gravitational effects because you also have effects from other stuff like barriers that have a lot of other different kinds of interactions except gravitational. Uh, so, uh, things will be more complicated here, but what do we then observe here? Well, the situation is not that different from the background, because basically we have one observation here, the C and D, okay? And then we have a bunch of observations at when the scale factor was like, Something like the half of what is today. today. We go slightly mm -hmm. higher when we're talking about the, the perturbations here, we maybe go to something like this. Uh, okay. <coughs> so, in the uh, cosmic microwave background, we basically we can just look at them, we can see that we have these different temperatures of the photons, and they will correspond to regions of space where you have uh, I mean, different uh, potentials in the early universe. Okay. So if you have some region where you have a very deep gravitational potentials, the photons originated from that region will be colder than photons originated from a region where you have a more shallow potential. So by observing the, the cosmic microwave background, we sort of get the initial conditions for the fluctuations <coughs> that we see today that then by gravitational collapse comes to be the galaxies and the galaxy clusters and everything. So at this point we have these fluctuations and they are of the order like 10 to minus 5. That's the typical order of the fluctuations C and B. And then we want to observe this at low redshift. And then you can do this in different ways. I mean one way is again to look at galaxies. And there you have to do a few assumptions. Because if you look at a specific type of galaxy, first you have to assume a model for how this galaxy represents the total natural content of the universe. It's not obvious that if you have some dense concentration of galaxies that this represents the underlying matter distribution. Normally it will not, so that is what is called bias. You have to try to correct for this. That different type of galaxies are uh, common in different types of environments. Some galaxy types prefer very dense environments, some galaxy types don't. So this already involves some modeling. And then of course if you're interested in the potential fluctuations, in the fluctuations in the gravitational potential, of course a given fluctuation in the density may not correspond to the fluctuation in the gravitational potential in the same way as it does in general relativity. So if you work on extended theories of gravity, you also have to take that thing to come into account. <coughs> there are some probes that actually are sensitive to the gravitational potential directly. One of those is gravitational density, which is uh, actually is a proof of the gravitational potential. Uh, so what we what do we then observe? Um, well, normally you say that, uh, as you mentioned, yeah, that we have uh, scale invariant invariant perturbations, and uh, let's see what what we mean by that. Normally what you mean by that is that uh, the problem doesn't have a scale. That you have something that looks like a power law, a power law doesn't have any scale. So if you just look at what we actually observe, uh, then you can plot the density fluctuations as a function of the spatial size of these density fluctuations. And then you would have something that looks uh, approximately like this. So if you plot log against log, you would have a large case, you have something that looks like a perfect power law here, and then you will have a slight kink in this, and then you might have something like this. Okay. <coughs> so from observation, we definitely have some kind of scale in this problem. And uh, so first, just let me say what is actually measured here. This, the largest scales, they are measured by the cosmic microwave background. This is what we measure in the temp temperature fluctuations. So this is sort of the uh, range of the 
CMB measurements. And then we have a lot of measurements that are connected to galaxies and galaxy clusters. So just by looking at how galaxies are correlated on the sky and making some assumptions about the bias and so forth, uh, you can measure stuff maybe in this range. You can also look at uh, galaxy clusters. You can look how common galaxy clusters of, of different masses are and then you can prove something a bit even uh, smaller scales here, and then you can actually go into even uh, even smaller scales here, which you usually <coughs> measure by measuring how hydrogen is distributed at a quite high redshift. This is the so-called Lyman alpha phase. Uh, so then the question is why? What is giving the scales in this problem here? Well, first of all, this kink here in the spectrum here is believe they now make some assumptions. In the standard lambda CDM uh, uh, scenario, this is due to the fact that when you have matter uh, gravitationally collapsing in the early universe, where the background was dominated by uh, relativistic matter, then you can see that it can't really cluster on small scales as effectively as it does on large scales. So that means that we get slightly less power on small scales of these galaxies here. And then what happens here is that you basically get into the regime where you have to take non-linearities into account. And then things start to become more complicated. Yes, Gershah. Uh, sorry, Edward. Uh, so this plot actually is a function of time, right? So, I mean, when you look at this, this like power spectrum or whatever, basically this, 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 this plot changes with time, right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. So yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you're talking about CMB, for example, at the same time. Like, oh, yeah. this, this is like this, a, this is normalized to take that into account, and it's very sketchy. So uh, okay, and and actually, in, it's not that sensitive. I mean, for most part, gravitational potentials stay the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the gravitational potentials they have stayed the same from a redshift of a thousand up until like a redshift of one. Yeah. So it's it's not a big difference, but it, it's sure it's important. One. Uh, <coughs> So, so then, uh, this can be more or less understood in terms of the lambda CDM model. Uh, and one thing, of course, is now I said that what gives us the initial conditions is what we measure the CMB. But then, of course, you want to get to the <coughs> fluctuations in the CMB. <coughs> and this is when inflation comes in again. Uh, so you can actually calculate that, again, assuming the standard lambda CDM uh, scenario, that in order to get what we observe at the CMB, you need a specific kind of uh, power spectrum in these fluctuations in the very early universe. And this is something that is uh, scale invariant in the following sense that it, it, I mean, data is perfectly consistent with that being a perfect power law. And uh, so in that sense, it doesn't have a scale. But what you also mean when you say that something is scale invariant is that uh, what you normally mean is the so-called harrison selvich spectrum. And that especially in the, in the sense that if I sit at some point here, the gravitational potential that I will experience will have equal contributions from fluctuations on all scales. That is what is meant by a scale invariant spectrum normally. And the CMB is almost consistent with that. Actually, in order to fit with the CMB, you need something that has slightly more power on high masses. That these large fluctuations would contribute a bit more to the gravitational potential of each one. But now, again, if you're interested in extended theories of gravity, you have to be a bit careful because you can see that there's actually a lot of extrapolation going on here. So imagine that we start out with some initial conditions in the very, very early universe, right after inflation, and then that should give you something that you actually observe in the CMB. That is, of course, very sensitive to your theory of gravity. Uh, so that means that if you start to uh, play around with your theory of gravity, you can also start to play around with your initial conditions. Uh, and this, of course, holds for everything I say now, that, that if you change your theory of gravity, everything that I've said so far is governed by the 
the gravitational field. Then you really have to sort of track all stuff that this would actually affect. And I'm not saying it's impossible yet, but you have to be quite careful because lambda CDM gives a pretty good uh, fit to what you observe. So that means that if you start to change something, you're really starting to rock the boat, right? And if you do that, I mean, you have to be prepared for the consequences that you will take. But of course, I mean, what you might want to accomplish with that could be worth it, right? Because the only problem with lambda CDM is, again, that <coughs> fits perfectly. It's only if you have a problem with the energy densities that you have to put into the universe that, 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 that this is actually a problem. Uh, because to, as you all know, in order to explain the background and to explain how these fluctuations grow, you basically need something that looks like a cosmological constant and you need dark matter. And you need both of these to have like sort of similar densities as, as the matter that we do observe like planets. <coughs> So this was the structure that we see. Any other questions or comments about this? Sorry, one last one. Yes. So how important it is to actually um, assume that you can work with perturbation? I mean, that's you know probably what I'm asking. So I'm of course in GR because you can do the linear perturbation that's valid in the, some regime, so you can use this and so on. But I mean, uh, this is not something that we really have to. Uh, Satisfy, right? I mean, no. I mean, for instance, here, <coughs> definitely, we have to work out the non-linear. Yeah, for, for stuff. GR, and, yes. and that is much more difficult. First, just from even if you just look at gravitational effects, it's much more difficult because the equations are so messy. So you basically have to use some analytical or any simulations to do this. And this is also why, normally, if you see this plot and people explain it and they try to get some limits on it and they start talking about Lyman alpha, you see a lot of people sort of well, I don't know. It, it's non-linear, and for good reasons, right? It, it's hard to have this kind of stuff. But also because you have to take into account non-gravitational effects. Because the baryons, they will not cluster in the same way as uh, other kind of non-interacting dark matter, because they could dissipate energy, and that means that they will clump together on smaller scales. So the smaller the scales here, the more important baryons become. And uh, that is very difficult. So this connects to the next Thing that I will discuss, namely when you go down to even smaller scales, when you look at galaxies and clusters, not the correlations between them, but actually the objects in themselves. Because then uh, the variance become really important. <coughs> and okay, so I will keep this really short here. Um, so basically, now, now we sort of uh, leave this time variable regime and we assume that we have objects that are more or less static. We just look at the spatial variations. And then we have known for almost as long as, as we have known that the universe is expanding that there seems to be a need for matter beyond the, the matter that we can actually observe. And this is basically just due to the fact that if you look at uh, galaxies and if you look at galaxy clusters and you look at how obvious moon it is, you can see that it should be a very deep potential well. And in order to get it that deep, you need more matter than you can see. So then this is uh, an additional proof that you should have this increased gravity on smaller scales, okay? <clears throat> and then if you go to even smaller scales, so then from clusters to galaxies, and then you can go to dwarf galaxies, you still need a lot of uh, more gravity than, than what you <coughs> actually see from the material that, that you can observe in the objects. But then there's, this is sort of the dividing limit. Of course, you have dwarf galaxies, and then you have globular clusters. They are sort of the same size. But in globular clusters, you can see now we're starting to enter a regime where you don't want any increased gravity. You don't need any dark matter. And if you go down to our solar system, you definitely <coughs> don't want anything except what you observe and the theory of general relativity. You need everything to be very, very close to, to that. And you can prove that on even smaller scales. So nowadays, I think you can go down to like micrometer scales and see that you have, you can't, you can't see any deviation from general relativity when this comes back to total gravity. So this means that the picture that we have so far is basically that on small scales, we won't have things looking like ordinary general relativity, 
if you increase the scale, you won't have an increased gravity, which is normally then represented as the dark matter in the lambda CDM model. And then if you go to even larger scales, you actually want repulsive gravity, which is then represented by the lambda in the lambda CDM model. Uh, one additional thing that I should mention in terms of observations here is that so far, uh, we have only talked about weak gravitational fields. Even when I talk about non-linear stuff here, the gravitational potentials are very small here. It's just the density fluctuations that becomes more the unit. It's the same in our solar system. All gravitational fields are, are small, uh, but, <coughs> but the uh, density fluctuations could be really large. No? Of course, you're interested in what happens if you have strong gravitational fields. And I would say that the most important measurement that I should mention here is if you look at the orbital decay of binary pulsars, because they really represent systems where you have stronger gravitational fields. And you can see that they are inspiring and they lose energy due to the <coughs> gravitational waves. And just to make a long story short, you can, you can show that this system shows that if you have any devi deviations from general relativity, it should be the maximum of the order of like one part in 10,000 or something. So even there, you don't want anything that differs too much from general relativity. Uh, so it's really on these larger scales that you want something in addition to our sort of standard model. Uh, so that is sort of the, the observational picture that I wanted to give you. So in, in short, uh, small scales, no deviation from general relativity, slightly longer scales like galaxies and so forth, and even in terms of structure formation, you need some increased gravity. Uh, and on even larger scales, you need something that could accelerate the expansion of the universe here. And actually, I mean, we have been discussing this a bit here, and Andrew gave a talk about that. I mean, one additional thing, of course, that you want to do is uh, uh, you might not be surprised that you have this accelerated expansion, you might be surprised that it's not completely dominated by this, but why you don't have the vacuum energy sort of completely overruling all other energy densities. And in order to do this, I mean, one way, one hope is that you get have a gravitational theory that actually screens the effect that you expect from vacuum energy from quantum fluctuations. Uh, so, in principle, like, you could say that on large scales you both want to screen off any contribution from vacuum energy, but you also want to have some uh, repulsive behavior of the larger scales, or it could just be that you screen off this part of the vacuum energy. You expect from what the field theory. Okay, so I think that was it. Uh, thank you very much.